you everybody for coming in on this kind of not raining Friday morning, um, depending on where you are. I'm really, really excited to introduce you all to Daniel Carrico. Um, I'm gonna read his little blurb because uh, I don't think I could ad lib it very well, but Daniel is Associate Professor of Fine Art Photography in the School of Arts and Design at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. So for those of you thinking about graduate schools and fine arts, check out that program, it's excellent. He's currently also serving as the school's assistant director and the coordinator of undergraduate programs. So Daniel's photographs have been shown in many notable galleries and museums, nationally, internationally, and in both print and online media. His images investigate environmental and political aspects of landscape, the use of land and cultural interpretations of inhabited space. These include several long-term photographic projects, such as his photographs of the aftermath of the Balkan War in his native Serbia, as well as the dramatic landscape changes in the endangered wetlands of Southern Louisiana. And Daniel's rich portraiture of arthropods was published in 2020 by Liver, uh, Live Right Books as a monograph, Aliens Among Us, Extraordinary Portraits of Ordinary Bugs. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. I, I highly recommend it. Um, Daniel, uh, I've known you for a long time and I'm just so happy you're here and talking to our students. So I'll, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so glad to uh, to be here and to have a chance to to share my work uh, with you guys. And uh, so um, I'm going to go ahead and start. I have my timer on. Um, so uh, let me share my screen with you guys. Duga duga duck. And here we go. So. Um, the way I kind of organize this lecture is to, to really kind of speak about my relationship to the land. And uh, so I promise everything will kind of coalesce at the end. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my past and then uh, talk about different bodies of work, uh, not necessarily in the chronological order, but more in the groupings of how I, how I kind of go back to them and treat them and, and, and think about them and revisit them. Um, so instead of my first photograph, which is sort of obligatory for the photographers to show, I'm going to kind of start over here. I promise I'm going to try to tie this back together. So um, because uh, many of you are students, I want to also include sort of the idea about the process. And while this is not my photograph, I'm going to let it represent sort of the finalized, finished um, sort of product if we think about the art as, as a finalized product. So most of us kind of present this as a as a shiny object that's that's presented with a you know in beautiful setting or or in a beautiful location, whether that be a gallery or a museum or something like that. But the truth is more like this, uh, where we are constantly um, sort of putzing around with stuff and making things work, and uh, during that time. Our friends are sort of leering at us from the side and, and our colleagues are kind of looking uh, back towards us. The reason I do that from my garage is because I don't really have a studio. I have sort of a boring office because most of my art is on the computer. So this let this be my studio, right? Um, but now I'm going to say sort of this is where I come from. I was born in Balkans and um, for the last well, for my entire career, the fact that I am a, that I am an immigrant um, uh, sort of shaped and framed the way I think about the landscape, the way I think about the land. So uh, Balkans, I was born in, in, in what used to be Yugoslavia. And um, it's interesting thinking about myself uh, thinking about the land that doesn't exist anymore. So the whole concept about the idea that you're born in one place that kind of changes along due to uh, human activity and becomes different entities. Plus, um, the geographical location where I was born is literally in uh, sort of a definition of the process of fragmentation and division of a region of state into smaller regions um so it's it's kind of a um it's kind of a weird to think about me as thinking about 
uh, or in, in my mind, it's kind of weird to think about the land as something that doesn't change, right? So um, my, uh, I was already here during the most recent war. Uh, I was in the States since 1994. And so I've seen the, the last war in my, my home country as a, as a sort of mediated experience, uh, whether through CNN or through some of these uh, images that I later received from my father who was photographing them uh, after as an aftermath of, uh, of the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999. Um, so when I returned, I was already um, sort of a graduate student. When I returned after that, this was, I would say, it's not the first photograph that I was, um, that I was um, sort of, uh, 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 that, that, that I considered a good photograph that I was proud of, but it was the first photograph that I, that kind of rang in my mind of what it connects to um, kind of how I think about the uh, photograph as a, as a medium, because immediately, um, it was the first photograph that immediately, uh, uh, that I knew immediately, like, oh, this is a, you captured something really interesting, right? Um, and uh, pretty quickly, I realized that there are these connections through the tropes of sort of the, the idea of that photography does rely on all of the, all of the pre uh, predecessors, all of the, all of the precursors to how we think about the images, right? Um, so I, I, sort of compare it to, to some of these um, uh, paintings from the early 20th century, right? There are sort of the groups of actors. Um, and uh, there is also kind of an interesting way that I think about uh, that here is the world going on while there is a destroyed bridge in the background, right? There is a, there is a continuation of life. So with that in mind, I, I started really thinking about these um, ideas of, of, um, of comparison, the ideas of, uh, of sort of simulacrum. So in a funny way, um, while I don't necessarily always show this photograph, this is a, a, a statue of Rocky uh, in the town of Žitište in Serbia that I, um, I, I'm a friend with a lot of journalists in, in uh, Serbia. And so while I was at home one time, um, my buddy was like, oh, they're going to reveal a Rocky statue. And I was like, wait, doesn't one already exist in Philadelphia? And so the, the town people were really happy that they hired somebody to create this one, which is six centimeters taller than the one in Philadelphia. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just love the idea that this is a copy of a statue to a fictional character that's still considered a piece of art in Philadelphia, but it was a movie prop. Okay. I love those layers. Anyway, so um, in the next, in this body of work that's kind of continuing, I have been looking as a, uh, these, these are photographs, not necessarily from a specific time and place, uh, but they share sort of these ideas about delineation. This is a Dubai Sharjah border. Uh, these are the two um, bordering Emirates at the, uh, in, in uh, um, Middle East in the United Arab Emirates, right? And I, and I just love that this, um, the only thing that represents this borderline between the two, uh, two countries is this uh, sort of uh, uh, barrier, concrete barrier that people move in order to cross from one into the other with their, with their off-road vehicles. So the porosity is a, is a pretty interesting thing. I was also dealing with the ideas of consumerism and the idea of, of consuming the nature. Um, so something like this, photographing nature from Smoky Mountains National Park. These were my students at the workshop, but I just love the idea that 
we have sort of designated locations from which to take perfect pictures, right? Something that something that somebody tells you, here is where you should stand in order to uh, get your own experience and record this experience yourself. Um, so all of these ideas are kind of in a larger body of work, but but I just tend to to think of them as as a unifying factor. So uh, something that's uh, that's the idealized presentation of nature, like this uh, uh, sort of uh, continuation of this. Uh, um, of this Ripley's Aquarium in the Smokies. So you have the, the uh, concrete or, uh, or plaster built uh, rocks that are containing this pool where there are you know, fish inside. Uh, but then we also sort of extend this landscape. So the presentation of the landscape is, is this uh, idealized um, sort of Caribbean uh, place. And I'm, I'm always fascinated with the with sort of dioramas. Actually, my first experience in a museum as a as a, a young person wasn't necessarily an art museum. I always always liked uh, natural history museums, which are, which is con continually going to sort of reemerge in my interest in making art. This idea of representation of nature, um, and therefore um, sort of controlling it. It goes really back to to uh, well to the colonial understanding of how we really think about the world around us, right? We're going to sort of build these uh, representational environments and include um, well, sort of uh, you know stuffed birds or or uh, or uh, taxidermied um, animals. Um, actually, the whole idea of taxidermy is something that that really kind of um, played along with the with the uh, uh, the book that Heather mentioned that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So this is another uh, diorama ant antelope diorama in Sharjah Natural uh, History Museum and Desert Park in Sharjah, uh, UAE. So. Back to that idea of, of cabinet of curiosities, right? So, so the cabinet of curiosities is uh, uh, if you haven't encountered it before, it's it's this kind of idea of the natural collection um, that comes from um, fairly early on in the in the 16th cent 17th century, and uh, it continues to play uh, with the idea of, of, in my mind, of controlling the nature, of setting things up, of, of um, man's sort of, at that time, definitely of man's sort of uh, control over nature, of, of, of the ownership of all things living and that, right, culturally, we were, as, as Western folk, we were really thinking about that. Uh, so I'm going to make a slight um, little diversion over here and start talking about this next body of work that was um, that's still continuing. Actually, if I think about it, this is the this is a group of images that I'm mostly interested in right now. And the reason for that is that it, they're not necessarily all new images. This one goes back to um, 2005. But during the COVID, uh, when I couldn't really travel, I was really interested in, in sort of relooking at the collection of images from, and this is my, my sort of most, um, most personal work, I would say, because it deals with my friends and family back in Serbia. So I, I keep going back and kind of rethinking uh, my relationship with the country that's now dim diminished. It's, a, it's now a country of Serbia instead of uh, the entire country of Yugoslavia. Uh, so this is Pera uh, or Petar singing uh, in 2005. I love these connections with the Western world, uh, Serbia or, or Yugoslavia at that time, um, or my entire life was was a country that uh, that existed between the East and the West. Uh, it wasn't really a country that belonged to the Warsaw Pact, but it also wasn't Western. It was pro-Western sort of socialist country, and so we uh, we 
uh, grew up on the on the uh, sort of borderline between the two sides. Um, and I like to kind of go back through the history and kind of record these things. So this is uh, this is the American airplane that was given to Serbia, well, to Yugoslavia after the Second World War uh, to help uh, sort of maintain the military presence in the in the Balkans. And this is the Republic F-84 Thunderjet, but if, of course it has Yugoslavian um, at that time Red Star uh, sort of. Um, uh, symbols on it. Um, I like to connect these also formally um, through some of these uh, images that are in the sequence. Uh, I like. I'm I'm kind of putting myself in the role of an observer, an outside observer, because it's uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I've left that country when I was 17, so in my in my mind, I don't really have the same experience that they had, but I'm, I'm also still sort of a, a designated, um, no matter how American I feel, I'm still kind of uh, uh, kind of in between the two countries uh, in, in a lot of ways. So this work is about that. It's about going back to, uh, to a place where you uh, have designated tables still <laughs> that are uh, giving you a smoking allowance inside of the bar. Um, and it's a it my my group of images specifically talks about this idea of summer. Um, Serbia and and the other countries that, that developed out of Yugoslavia, so Croatia, Slovenia, and all of them have um, have a huge brain and and um, uh, and sort of skill drain at this at this time. Um, there is more uh, Serbians, first generation or temporary workers uh, outside, living outside of Serbia than inside currently. Um, and so that means that all of your uh, low skilled and high skilled workers are going to go for uh, uh, work positions, at least temporary to EU. Um, and like, or like me, immigrate somewhere else and then go back home during the summer. So the summer is sort of this time when, uh, when there are meetings and celebrations and sort of like the, it's, it's, a, it's a temporary shift from the existence in the country that, uh, that's kind of going through its own growing pains back to so almost the time when everything was Better. So there's festivals, there's uh, people sitting in coffee shops, people grilling obscene amounts of meat like this. This is uh, my dad. Um, I guess we were just expecting some guests. I hope we did. Otherwise, yeah. Um, there are uh, these awful, fierce creatures uh, there. Um, this is uh, Kiki, my uh, aunt's dog. So I like to kind of connect these through humor and also make them a little bit brighter, a little bit sort of saturated, make them a little bit kind of um, interesting in a way that they, that they tie in this whole idea of, of celebration. But they also emphasize this idea of trauma that's there under the surface. Um, so there is there is this kind of like um, uh, sort of lyrical documentary that goes through through these images, and to me they're not necessarily about um, about specifically the portraits. I don't I wouldn't classify them as portraits. I would classify them as as a sort of this um, um, uh, allegory about the about the land. That's, that doesn't exist, but maybe still exists during this time uh, while I'm photographing these images. Um, um, so another kind of connection. Um, uh, and these are some of the latest photographs that I took. So this is uh, my friend, Nicola, that I, one of my oldest friends, we, we were literally babies together. So. I just love that he 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 bought this uh, little property that outside of town that he's uh, has his garden in, and uh, 
poor city boy just burned himself to crisp while working in the garden. So I just uh, love this photograph. Um, and then there is this idea of this like luxury, right? These are my aunt and uncle and they worked their whole, so they're the previous generation that left. They're the generation that kind of came back um, from Germany after working there to retire to Serbia. And this is their retirement. There is also kind of, as I said, this, this idea that there is um, kind of tension with flooding, there is tension with, uh, but there is also sort of celebration and silliness and uh, my uncle sort of pretending to um, give pig roast the beer. Um, and this idea that, that, you know, what is more Yugoslavian than Yugo? I don't know if you, you guys might be too young for that, but like Yugo was uh, sort of semi-successfully imported to the United States, but there is nothing more emblematic of, of like a bunch of guys working on the car in the middle of the street because it died. So again, another jump. Um, what happened to me is that I um, signed up to be a student, exchange student in um, Thibodeau, Louisiana in 1994. And that's how I ended up moving to this country. So it's this tiny little dot in the south uh, eastern Louisiana, really a Cajun country, as, as Thibodeau name says. Um, and pretty soon, um, my interests were tied into this idea of, again, land loss. Uh, the southern Louisiana is, is really suffering from, uh, from amazing land loss. Um, the idea that um, uh, the in this red area that you can see, that's just under New Orleans and, and these other towns. Uh, basically, every half an hour, uh, a, a football field worth of, of uh, wetlands disappears, sinks, uh, gets dredged out. So that on average, that's the speed of the land loss in Louisiana. So the map of Louisiana is almost completely different now than it was uh, seven years ago. And I had to, this is one of the process, this is one of the projects that I've photographed for the longest time. So here's the same house in 2005 and 2011, right? This is what they called camps. So I had the opportunity to really look at this idea of, of land change, but not at the geological scale, but more of an annual scale, right? So this an entire, pro, the entire beachfront disappeared uh, in you know, less than 10 years. So uh, the opportunity was there because my, my old professors uh, the guy who was walking on the beach uh, in the previous photograph uh, organized this workshop in this wonderful area. This is a marine lab uh, called LUMCON, Louisiana University's Marine Consortium. And this area, um, this, this uh, place housed us uh, year after year. Uh, and uh, we could rent boats and, and go out to the islands, barrier islands and recording uh, all of this land change. Uh, unfortunately, even this facility that was finished in the 80s is now so far under, well, it's not underwater continually, but the water, the, the loss of wetlands is threatening it, so they're going to actually abandon it pretty soon. Uh, so my first sort of big body of work came out of that, and I decided to photograph these with the uh, hand um, made or the constructed pinhole camera, my colleague John Mann called it the world's most um, overbuilt pinhole camera. And he was probably right. This was me playing with the laser cutter and kind of constructing something that could be portable enough and sturdy enough to take into the wetlands and use Polaroid um, film to, uh, to create the image. It was important for me to create the images at the islands, right? So this is a type 55 peel away um, film that I used. And this was um, over, probably over six years, uh, starting in 2005, 2006 through 
2006 through 2011, yeah. Um, so these were until I ran out of that film because it's no longer produced anymore. So this is the first oil on the Timbalier Island from the Deepwater Horizon. So we were there when the fresh oil started appearing from that uh, particular uh, disaster. Um, the last camp, so in Ile de Nier, the, the white one in the background is the one that you saw in the photograph. So that one was sort of like an anchor that I kept going back to. And here it is in 2011, photographed with this. This is a long exposure with these pinholes. So it's usually five to 10 seconds long. Um, and then ultimately at the same time, I was photographing more in the sort of documentary style. Uh, so the communities down there are really kind of suffering this water incursion. So this is a Gulf water. Uh, this wasn't even a stormy day. This was just a high tide. So their culture, their, um, their locations, all of their, um, and, and I, like, I like to look at the, the, the sort of uh, graveyards as the anchors of the communities that were there because everybody who had sort of a community would build it around the uh, church, around the graveyard. And so almost everything is gone except for these temporary homes, right? And even the roadside, um, sort of recent roadside crosses, this is from the 2016, last year, that's starting to go underwater. So it's really an amazing thing to watch from the environmental standing. Uh, so I keep going back uh, to that location. So if you, if you're kind of looking at um, the time uh, for this project, um, uh, depending on what cameras are used and, and all of that, I started photographing there in, in 1999. So uh, while still in undergraduate school and continued returning almost every year um, up until last year. So 20 years, of a project photographing the same locations, uh, albeit in a different type of medium. So um, this is a um, uh, commentary by Edison Dardar, this guy who is uh, part of the, he's one of the uh, sort of elders of a Biloxi Chiramacha Choctaw tribe um, in the place called Ile de Jean Charles uh, down in Louisiana. And they are phenomenal. They're losing so much land. Literally, they're back. They're down on less than ten percent of their their uh, nation's land. Um, so this is the the only road that leads to the island. As you can see in the background. So I'm really fascinated with this idea. And this is the the community. So people are still living in some of these, but. Um, there is, I think, down to 57 or 50, um, obviously that was the, the number from a couple of years ago, but that's how many uh, residents still remained in Ile de Jean Charles. Um, so again, fascination with this idea that in somehow I feel towards them the way I feel towards my, my homeland, um, or at least in the, in the similar way as an artist, right? Uh, this is an example of the uh, coastal erosion on the Grand Isle in Louisiana. And this is, so this is 2017, this is 2019. Um, the way they decided to, um, to kind of control this drop off and this coastal erosion is to put a bunch of rock on the on the uh, front. Uh, of course, that doesn't make for a nice beach uh, front. And uh, even here in North Carolina, we have a lot of that kind of washout, right, from the communities like this, from the beach, but not quite as bad as Louisiana. So the town, typical towns might look like this. Um, I used a film here. This is a six by 12 camera. It's a panoramic film camera. Uh, because I was always, I always enjoyed that kind of connection to that wide landscape in Louisiana. It's, it's extremely flat, right? Here's again that, uh, uh, that property, that, that uh, abandoned camp. And finally, in 2019, uh, it actually completely collapsed into the surf. Um, 
I, I don't think I included some of these, but some some of these are are like remnants of industry there. So I'm gonna try to kind of go at a faster pace over here. And again, connections with this sort of spirituality and the and the idea of the um, of the same graveyards that I showed you in color. Okay, so um, I moved to uh, Florida after grad school, and that place itself represented kind of interesting problems. So this was exactly during 2008-2009 um, property crisis. So um, I decided to uh, make this project with a colleague of mine who was a sculptor in, in Florida State University where I worked. And we started looking at the family owned farms, but pretty quickly we understood that there was this, this kind of a disjointed connection of the family of the uh, farm owning and uh, sell off to developers. So this is this is like your typical sort of uh, model home, right, with all the palms. But um, the real, I, I just love this delineation between the real landscape of northern of Florida, of Florida Panhandle with this uh, scrub pine, and the properties that have uh, palm trees, right. And when they're abandoned, uh, or when the side next to them are not developed, you have this kind of really uh, weeded out place. So we had a chance of um, actually renting an airplane. Um, at that time, drones were not a thing, or at least not to me. And so I was really photographing again how how people in Florida were living. I call this one the hive, but mostly we were interested in the um, properties that suddenly stopped being developed. So uh, from our point of view, uh, Florida was, um, was an agricultural state, right? We called the project Beyond Disney. So uh, gradually these, these uh, 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 orchards uh, and um, the uh, uh, land that was used for cattle was sold off in order to develop these these uh, sort of properties. Um, but the land in Florida is so um, the the fertile land topsoil is so thin that once you scrape it off to uh, get rid of the the fields, you can no longer use it for really anything else, even if you can't develop property. So I just love this uh, sort of idea that all of these homes are are really kind of nice and established homes. Um, but they at that time, they were not sold beyond this. So, so you don't see any construction going on at the time. Uh, everything sort of stopped, right. And I just love this that, you know, this person in the bottom right has the edge off of which they can fall into this sort of sandy soil. Just their own little rectangle of Florida happiness. It was about American life. It was about thinking about these cul-de-sacs that were kind of built together. This is actually on the, on the uh, area where there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, golf courses and that elaborate sort of castle looking thing, which is a clubhouse. So from a from the point of, of a criticism, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take that. I was looking at these. They kind of start looking like an insect antenna, which puts me back into the idea of arriving to North Carolina, to Greenville. And uh, ironically, I rented a house on the cul-de-sac. Cul-de-sac, by the way, is a French for uh, bottom of the bag. So it doesn't really uh, have like any glamorous um, uh, uh, no notion behind that. But because the property in North Carolina was so new, I pretty soon started seeing like all of these insects that were kind of occupying my space. And I started thinking back to this idea. I, I love this piece. This is Albert Durer's Rhinoceros, right? And the story behind this is that Albrecht Durer um, 
actually uh, uh, illustrated this rhinoceros based on a, a small sketch and the sort of uh, letter description of the animal that died in transport from Portugal, right? And so I love that this is artist representation of wildlife. It's not the most accurate, but it's the most fantastic and most sort of, um, when you think about it, that this, this kind of, uh, this is an understanding that Europeans used for centuries after to think about rhinoceros because they didn't see the, the real one, right? And so I had the opportunity to work with scanning electron microscopes. And uh, I pretty quickly selected to collect these uh, insects and arthropods and um, start recording how they are looking, going back to this idea of of thinking about them as, as portraits of our not really often seen roommates. So I would collect these at uh, uh, going to work around the house, around the yard. So these are not, a, 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 not a, any uh, exotic pets or anything like that. So the top left is actually uh, a photograph with a light microscope or, or a stereo microscope for the color then I would record, I would move it into the scanning electron microscope, which records bounced off electrons. So it's actually not a visual element. It's like a, a representational, almost so you can think about it as a small sculpture. Um, and then that data would be combined with the color in order to get this very sort of pictorial representation of a weevil over here. So some of my early ones, I started really thinking about them as a, oh, these are these are really looking like something from um, Mos Eisley Cantina in, in uh, Star Wars. This was the first one that I kind of collected inside of the house. This is a, a carpet beetle larva. You probably have them at your place. Pretty soon I started working with the entomologist from uh, UNC, um, for, I'm sorry, from, from uh, NC State and uh, for the uh, identification, but also really to kind of share ideas and talk about various different things. So uh, his name is uh, Rob Dunn and he's a phenomenal writer. Um, so before I jump to that one, um, he told me that there's, well, their, their research confirms that there's about 200 different species living in your home at any point in time. Anyhow, um, so pretty soon as a photographer, I started looking at these uh, tropes of a kind of classical portraiture. See what I mean? Um, so you can kind of really look at these as, as identify, uh, as, as a sort of individualized creatures. I just love the way that, that they kind of have the same look here. And, Ultimately, I settled on to uh, to depicting them in a in a way that that sort of uh, northern uh, Baroque painters uh, used the lighting, the line quality, the backgrounds. They're sort of un unidentifiable, but they're a result of the of the sort of use of the microscope, as you can see on this one. And. To bring it all back to the idea of cabinet of curiosities, um, again, there is there is that connection with the with the sort of collect you know, the idea of collecting the uh, animals, and also my fascination with how people um, think of animals as a collection or the nature as a collection, uh, just like the way that I I think about the landscape as a collection. So this is a if you're ever in Florence, Italy, the best place to visit is La Specola. It's there, one of the oldest collections of the natural world there. And this was actually Medici's pet pygmy hippo that they uh, badly um, preserved. So uh, the, the uh, titles for these are also so, sort of quasi-scientific because I include the idea of uh, location and the date, um, but not a specific enough date and not a specific enough collection or, or location. 
in order to uh, to present these. And I'm mainly looking for them as as this kind of anthropomorphized uh, creatures with a lot of character. There's a this is the one with the with the coolest uh, name, I think, Great Leaf Skeletonizer Moth. This is a horse fly. Those, those are like the real, so the colors are real as way the colors are real with anything. Uh, what I mean by that is that colors are dependent on the light, light source. So the light sources that I use um, in uh, uh, taking these images are LEDs, small studio lighting. So I kind of arrange them on a little goosenecks and there's like little reflectors and all that. So I'm, I'm sort of playing with the microscopic scale of, uh, of a studio lighting in order to record these. And some of these are, you know, I, I hope most of them are humorous, but like dance, porch light, evening, May 31st. Christmas cactus, flower pot, kitchen window. Uh, and at the same time, just like with the other landscapes that I was photographing, during the process of photography, something comes up. Uh, like so, so this project lasted for about eight years and uh, the kind of closer to the end of the project, I realized that there was all these articles coming out about the disappearance of the, uh, of the insects in Europe and in the United States. Uh, so you can look it up. It's called, the, uh, you can refer to it as a, as a windshield um, sort of factor. In other words, the insects are disappearing from being sort of pounding your, your, your windshield as you're driving by. Oop, that was my timer. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, these are some ways that I represent these. Um, and uh, 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 I like to present them to various different audiences. This is, this is a coffee and this for the Han Science Library. And this was a presentation there. And ultimately, uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, I was extremely lucky in order to be able to uh, put together a book um, that came out last year. Uh, and I collaborate, this is one of the pages, there's a uh, 60 something insects in there. And uh, so uh, a colleague of mine who's an entomologist uh, wrote the descriptions of the insects and another colleague actually illustrated these wonderful little drawings that are in the book. Um, and what I'm doing now is, this is uh, um, something that I did over the uh, COVID pandemic last year. So I decided to look really close to my own backyard. So this is uh, stacked photography from various different times. And I just kind of wanted to see this idea of uh, uh, that, um, you know, the time, I was playing with the time passage uh, in suburbia. So all of these, Things are not there at the same time, but I just love to uh, to play with that kind of expanded time photography. Thank you so much. That's what I have. Uh, so I'm going to open this for for some questions if you have them. Thanks so much, Dana. Oh my gosh! At first, I was like, uh, I saw the fox and the cat. I mentioned. I'm like, that's that's my backyard at any normal day. Yeah. So <laughs> pretty much. So we have a bunch of um, really great uh, questions from some of our students and um, who are uh, in their BFA uh, thesis class. Um, but students uh, and listeners, um, feel free to type in your questions also. So yeah. um, the, the first one I um, wanted to ask you was actually coming from Amber, um, mm -hmm. who made an observation earlier too about um, uh, sort of emigration in Appalachia as being very similar to what's happening in Serbia. Um, but this is actually about, this question is about the, um, the work with the, uh, the insects. Um, she says, I found this quote from the New York Times article insightful into Daniel's work. We noticed the losses, said David Wagner, an entomologist at the University of Connecticut. It's an diminishment we, that we don't see. Daniel, how do you maintain your resilience when so much of your work focus, focuses on an urgent but slowing unfolding crisis? And I, I think that connects to your work in, in Louisiana as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's something that I um, I don't know resilience, right? It's it's a 
it's an interesting way of of how we present ourselves in public. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I've always, I was always rational enough to think about the idea of of the change as as not something that I don't want to be sort of overly sentimental towards, right? Because it is a part of the process. So um, I try to kind of um, step away from from that and think about it in a more scientific way and think about it in a problem and problem solving idea so i i don't know that i'm really good at dealing with it as much as much as uh, as sort of understanding that um um you know i the more i photograph the more i uh, study the more i think about the science the more i think about these these um things that i'm trying to use as um, a starter for my art images, um, the more I can kind of think about in terms of um, stepping back and understanding that I'm I'm a fairly small part of like really tiny part of this entire world, uh, and it humbles me. Uh, but on the other hand, it it helps with I guess resilience. <laughs> so sort of I mean it sounds like. Um then in a way like uh grounding your your photographic work and research that research itself becomes kind of a buffer on an emotional psychological level maybe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so right. um uh, uh malik one of the the bfa students asked a really good question about your balkan series and i and this is another one of the questions i think you could really talk about um in relation to the louisiana work as well um what have been the 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 um impacts uh or what ways has your those series impacted the communities and so i think he he was a uh, meaning um the, uh, has it impacted the um uh, your community back home in serbia but i think i think there is a reciprocity to that you know there's also the, the community of the audience wherever it's showing so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about how your work has been um, received by those communities um maybe have, have they had an impact or what does mm -hmm. that look like um yeah, yeah, that's a, that's always a good question. Uh, uh, as far as Louisiana stuff, and I, maybe I can start with an easier uh, answer there. Um, I've, um, uh, due to my connection with the university, uh, I've been a part of the what's called here at DCU uh, EOSA, the, the Engagement and Outreach Scholars Academy. So it's, it's kind of like a nice training that we receive. And so it involved me going back and working with the community in Louisiana and actually um, establishing a website. Uh, it's not defunct, but but it was a kind of a, a outreach uh, process that I involved other people telling their stories about the environment. Um, and so that was uh, sort of writing on the side of my work. Um, and so maybe maybe a more direct and quite the easier way to to understand that because everybody you know I I was there for a week or two every year but I they were there for the whole time and they could definitely continue watching. Um, so in a lot of ways, if I was there periodically, I could see the the changes easier, right? Instead of sort of watching the water boil. Um, as far as the uh, community in in Serbia, uh, as I said, that work is I've, I'm always kind of carrying the camera and photographing, and and uh, but the work that's been represented for Serbia has not been actually shown, even though it's kind of quite an old work. It's been shown in pieces, maybe one photograph here and there, but but this is a sort of uh, oddly enough, you know, it took sort of pandemic for me to say let me extract you know my uh, out of my archive for for the past 15 years and look at how i can tell this story and maybe um uh really uh, get myself to go back and, and now photograph with the purpose of doing that so so in a lot of ways uh it was kind of a historical weird presentation so um, I, they're all willing participants, of course, they, they know that I'm a photographer, but, uh, how do, uh, it's, uh, they're telling me their story, right? Quite often, uh, I listen about politics. I listen about all of these things. So it, it kind of gives them an output 
um, through my images as well. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, you know, sometimes I think about um, uh, not not so much documentary photography, but um, photography that's really grounded around a particular community. Mm -hmm. it, a lot of times it sort of resonates as kind of a love song to that community. And, you know, love songs, you know, at their best, um, love you warts and all, as it were. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, I, I, I can see that. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, wait, I just, there's just one that just came in in the chat. Um, from Matt Gross, I'm also from Europe and can really relate to the culture and significant changes of the years. I haven't been to Europe in years. I'm wondering if you know, uh, know or of or are aware of um, cultural and art changes and developments that have occurred there. Um, I, I think I think maybe what he's meaning, if I, if I understand correctly, and Matt, I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding, is um, so over the course of that that body of work. Um, have you mm -hmm. noticed shifts um, in the sort of cultural and art landscape or the, the works that are be creating by artists there in Serbia? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've been lucky to, um, some of our, my family friends are, are actually artists and curators at our uh, museum there. So I've been a part of, of uh, a little bit of part of that community as well. So it's kind of interesting to, to look at um, it was mostly interesting, specifically in in the case of of northern Serbia, where I come from, uh, to look at how technology actually influenced uh, the way that they are approaching art. So that was the biggest change, and of course, like that's kind of here as well. So it was it was just a few years maybe later there. Um, so it's an interesting kind of connection because there's a lot there's more support in Europe generally. Um, from the state side to the artist, right? But there is also kind of a little bit, there's a little bit less support in terms of, uh, in terms of academia and education, right? There's, there's right. only like two, uh, three art schools in my country, right? So it's, it's, um, you have a narrower start and you don't have that kind of university support that we have, but they have uh, generally, uh, municipal uh, municipal sport and and those kind of things and of course with my friends you know I'm I'm kind of photographing them like the first guy who's standing on a car he's now running this uh, online radio station he's got kids now and it's kind of interesting to me to to like look at the changes over over <laughs> the years of how you know we would go partying together and now you know he's and a now you have kids. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. But <laughs> yeah, but you're affected by his kids by proxy. Affected, so, yeah, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, that, that brings up a really good point, too, though, about the Im impact of, of changing technologies, you know, so we're, we're sort of in Industry 4.0 right now, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, the pandemic has shown a really big spotlight on the role um, uh, communication technologies have played in, in our lives categorically. Um, mm -hmm. But especially for artists, I think it, it sort of presents these real interesting questions and challenges. And one of the things that I really appreciate about the arc of your work is how um, the technology of photography is, ha, appears really fluid through your work, um, mm -hmm. but there's always, it's always um, a big part of the consider consideration. Like I loved the overbuilt laser cut pinhole camera. I mean, there's just, there's so many layers of technology things there that, that could be impact. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you see that dynamic between technological innovation and evolution um, and how on one hand it's, it's creating these things like the electron microscope to, mm -hmm. to get this imagery that's so informative and astounding. Um, and yet at the same time, a lot of these same technologies are you know, part and parcel to the climate change that's decimating Louisiana, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's always on my forefront of, of well, first of all, I, um, I'm a bad artist in terms of like, I didn't develop my, you know, people ask me, look, like, how do I develop my own style? I'm like, well, I was always interested in adopting the style, adopting the approach conceptually to the to what I was talking about. So, so there are reasons that I use specific kind of a camera, specific kind of equipment, right? Because it it makes connections with the ideas that are expressed in the work, hopefully. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and the other one is as a classically trained photographer, um, it's it's kind of 
it's it can be mind boggling and, and sort of our community has split in the mind boggling kind of like I'm sticking to my guns, right? I'm I'm holding on to the onto the idea of the film. Um and or the people who are like, well, yeah, I can try this, I can try that. I can, you know, of course, the whole idea that that we live now up until now everybody's making videos, right? But uh <laughs> Up until um, only a few years ago, uh, like the, there was this prolification of of uh, the use of phone camera and and how do you talk about something that's supposedly rarefied as art when when you have the entire community kind of creating right not not everybody's painting not everybody's creating sculptures not everybody's uh, you know doing doing those kind of more discipline oriented pieces of 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 sort of uh art but everybody is making photographs so how do you define that and to me that the intent of creating art is something that's not necessarily based on the idea of what kind of technology i use uh, but the technology that i use should be appropriate to the idea that i that i have so why my background is also mechanical engineering right so so i always had that kind of connection with the um tinkering <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that answers i'm not sure if that answers the no the, the it does it, it and no. it, it gets at some really interesting things too about that nature of audience you know like mm -hmm. when like i think i think it's incredibly exciting right now to see how many people, um, and I'm speaking as a digital media artist, right? Like my, my background's in traditional media. Yeah. And I sort of learned the technology just because like I worked in graphic design to pay the rent literally like one year, yeah. you know? And so <laughs> like, oh, well I can use this to make art too. Um, and so, but at any rate, like I think it's really exciting to see how many people are using these technologies to make imagery, to make visual culture, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's, it's being directed towards audiences that we haven't traditionally thought about and either high art or advertising for that matter. Like there's these, these intermediary audiences. So I was, um, one of the, the BFA students, actually a couple of them asked questions about how you think about audience and, and sort mm -hmm. of who, who are your target audiences and, and, and how do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I, I love that because you know, mostly uh, if you're if you get into grant writing or or representing your connecting with with galleries or connecting with anything, uh, they're going to ask you what who your audience is and, and how do you think about that, and um, and in a lot of ways, uh, I'm, I'm not um, I'm not necessarily interested in uh, in again like sort of high audience, uh, even though it's great when when it happens, right? But but in a lot of ways, the the issues that I that I like to discuss are not necessarily um, so out of touch with with uh, everyday audiences. And um, so I was um, lucky that I had the opportunity to use the I mean, that's nature of being at the university, right, uh, which is also something that's that's uh, fantastic um for the for being an artist right but it, it that interdisciplinary nature of of at least my approach i i really think of of uh audiences for for this last project like the, the whole idea of uh of recording portraits of these insects that we don't think about as as uh as a sort of uh that mega uh, you know charismatic megafauna uh everybody's going to notice if if the white rhino disappears right um but nobody's going to necessarily even pay attention to to a bunch of bees well bees yes because yeah. we're directly going to be in fact but you know there are thousands of species of bees we're only looking at the european honeybee um where the other ones are having problems as well uh, so as pollinators, like the whole idea of pollinators, we relate to them uh, in terms of like, what do they do for us, right? Uh, but um, that's, sorry, I kind of ventured onto it. No, no, that just makes sense. But Keep in going. a lot of ways, it's, 
it's it's very much uh, open towards just about anybody as audience and the best audience actually um for that work for the arthropods work are like the kids <laughs> yeah they love it right because <laughs> it's, it's these weird bugs right it's kind of anything that you can give to kids that's like slightly gross but kind of interesting <laughs> It's a winner, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and like, and they're the ones who are yeah. going to be the policymakers and not long. Like, I think we, Hopefully. it's really easy for us to forget that, that like, yes, they're 10 right now, but yeah. before this generation graduates from graduate school, they're going to be like, hey, I'm voting. <laughs> yeah. So I, I realize it's, it's already uh, 1220 oh, and yeah. I, I got really excited about talking about things. So um, uh, I, I think um, Mark and uh, did you want to sign off or, or? <laughs> or do I sign off? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Heather. Uh, fascinating, fascinating conversation. Um, great presentation. I have a question. I have a question, but maybe we're out of time. So uh, maybe there will be. I'm good if you are. I mean. Okay. So I have a question which is kind of relates to your very first uh, first part of your presentation and relates to your Serbia, Serbian identity. Those images, those images you were showing. Uh, from right after the war and kind of at the time, almost at the time of the war, made me think about your identity and the operation, the Noble Anvil. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm referring to? Um, uh, operation Noble, Noble Anvil uh, was a bombing of uh, Serbia by yeah, yeah. forces and NATO. In Yugoslavia, uh, they translated this in kind of wrongly calling a merciful angel. But uh, it kind of creates interesting context for all of us thinking mm -hmm. about it and possibly for you making work about Serbian community, your family and life, living in the United States and pretty much talking about enemy of the United States. Yeah. Well, uh, interestingly, and I mean, Interestingly enough, right? There is so many of us who are who are from Serbia, from Eastern Europe, uh, living in the United States, and um, like United States is such a such an interesting uh, group of of communities um, because also when you think about who are the how do we classify the the enemies? And of course, the, the, I I I laugh when I when I watch like the action movies because it's always like the the, the enemy of the moment um, that like later on will be friends or whatever. So like I think Serbians were were for a moment there. There's there's like that really bad movie like like the, the um, behind enemy lines, which was like the vehicle for for uh, one of the um, Wilson. Uh, Luke Wilson, not Luke Wilson, uh, the other one. Anyway, uh, so yeah, you know, that in itself are these layers of understanding of like, well, there is of course a Russian community in, in the United States. There is Serbian community in the United States that, that um, Serbians were not enemies. Serbians were allies in the, 20, uh, in the early 20th century and, and of, of course, after the Second World War and, and so forth and so on. So like a, a number of immigrants, um, there's, there's tons of communities up in uh, Chicago area, right? Um, Serbian communities, right? And so a lot of those guys came in during the 70s. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I never really thought about the pretty early on i guess i i understood that uh playing politics is is not something that relates to to this national idea of uh, of like who's my enemy and who's not um especially in the united states where you have wars that are kind of created based on uh different resources you know so maybe that answers your question maybe not but <laughs> oh it's definitely complicated yeah and and you know, as the past time, pine, uh, time, pine, uh, uh, you know, looking in a kind of historical perspective, uh, we've, we're mm -hmm. forgetting about those events. But at the time, probably they were significant for Serbians who felt, well, we're always allies to United States and to the West and what's happened to us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and on this very positive note, <clears throat> 
So this was great. Thank you so much. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel. This was Absolutely. really, really, Thank really you, fun. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, everybody.